Welcome back, everyone, and good evening. Um, it's my privilege to introduce our second keynote speaker, Dr. Sonia Thomas of Colby College in Waterville, Maine, where she teaches women, sexuality, and gender studies. Sonia earned her doctorate at Rutgers University, which is not far up the road from here. Her areas of expertise to mention but a few include Syrian Christianity in South India, critical race feminisms, and the South Asian diaspora in rural America. Now, Sonia herself is a South Asian American and hails from Montana near the North Dakota border. I, I think you'll probably hear a bit more about that uh, from her. Now, on top of that, Sonia is an insightful ethnographer the author of a new book, still fresh off the press, published late last year by the University of Washington Press, called Privileged Minorities, Syrian Christianity, Gender, and Minority Rights in Postcolonial India. Now, here's a copy of it. There aren't many copies around, but you do see flyers. Focused on an understudied Christian community of great antiquity, which Sonia aptly characterizes as a dominant minority, a rather counterintuitive concept for world Christianity. The book will be of interest to a broad spectrum of scholars, from South Asianists and social scientists to folks like many of us in the room in world Christianity, the anthropology of Christianity, and collateral fields. Now, since the book is so new, I'm going to crib from the jacket. A, a helpful overview, I think, of its subject matter and its methodology, and I wouldn't be surprised if you're the author of it. <laughs> Syrian Christians in Kerala, India, although a demographic minority, are not a subordinated community. They are caste, race, and class privileged, and have long benefited economically and socially from their privileged position. Drawing on oral histories, ethnographic interviews, and personal insights, Thomas employs an intersectional approach and feminist theory to interrogate the relationship between religious rights and women's rights in Kerala. By ex uh, exploring how inequalities within groups shape very different experiences of religious and political movements, Thomas lays the groundwork for imagining new feminist solidarities across religions, castes, races, and classes. The title of her keynote, you see it right up there, um, and also some very interesting news. She is now associate professor with tenure. <laughs> So feminist ethnography and studying up in world Christian studies afterwards. For a respondent, we have invited Dr. Aaron Rafferty of the faculty here at the seminary to share a few observations. Aaron did her MDiv here at the seminary and then a PhD in anthropology over at Princeton University next door. But first, Professor Thomas, please welcome her. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging the indigenous peoples of this land, the Lene Lenape and the Powhatan Renape Indians. Thank you everyone for having me here. It really is an honor. Um, I want to do first a shout out to some members of the audience. My sister Diana is here who always has taken care of me. Um, my nephew Ajay, he's uh, a cadet at West Point but he's on spring break. Um, and uh, I'm immensely proud of him and my mother, Mary Thomas. My mother is the most selfless person I know. She's taking care of her siblings, her in-laws, her nieces and nephews, her six kids, my dad, who passed away in February of 2006, 16, sorry, um, and I owe her so much. I don't think I ever tell her enough how much I love her and appreciate all that she's done for us. I'm gonna cry. <laughs> 
Uh, I also want to thank the grad students here who've done so much to keep this conference on track. Um, Richard asked me if I had a flyer for my book, which I did not because I, like many women in academia, I'm very bad at promoting my own work. I feel like it, I'm, I feel embarrassed that it's kind of like self-aggrandizement, um, which of course men are often praised for doing in academia, but women tend to not do it. So then I went back and I, I made a flyer, um, and then I asked the graduate students to print it out, which they did, um, and now you have it. <laughs> um, a special thank you to Amy Ellen for the behind the scenes organizing and for the travel that she did, and to Erin Rafferty, who's going to be responding, and to Richard Young, who was my point person, and also um, all the work that he did to help not only bring me here, but to bring my kid. Um, and if you, you, some of you probably see her, she was tramping around with me all mornings, in the mornings and in, in the night. Um, so I just wanted to start by saying something about being a single parent in academia. I've always been a single parent in academia. Um, only last year I was uh, um, able to admit this publicly. Uh, I was in an abusive relationship for many, many years, um, and I finally filed a restraining order against my now ex-husband, and a week after that I found out I was pregnant. That was the same year that I was defending my dissertation. So when I went on the, yeah, you can't make this stuff up. So when I went on the market, um, I had a newborn baby, and I'll have to, I have to say, like, I, I don't think that being a single parent is that different all the time than being in a two-parent household, except for when it comes to going to conferences and going to invited lectures. Um, I now live in a state, the state of Maine, where I have no family. So what am I going to do with my kid for 24 plus hours? She has to come with me. And now that my book is published, I've been trying to um, lean in, if you will, and um, ask to that my needs to, to do the work in academia is to bring my kid with me. Um, however, <laughs> I am running into a problem, and it's an institutional problem. It's institutional red tape. I'm often told that the, suddenly there's a liability issue, even if like the department and the professors involved really want to support this. Um, institutions say, we can't do this. Um, this is a liability issue. Travel agencies say, we can book your ticket, but we can't book hers. Um, I, we're doing these crazy things. I was just at Oberlin, and we did this really crazy thing about like booking the tickets, and then when I went to try and check in, they couldn't find her reservation, and they could only find my reservation. It's like crazy. Um, and I, I want to say, like, I'm very um, appreciative of all the jumping through hoops that professors are doing here and, and staff are doing here to try and make this happen. Um, but I want to talk about, like, what institutions and institutionalized sexism, racism, homophobia looks like. Um, with all these lawyers that colleges and universities have, I mean, are you telling me that you can't draw up a liability waiver? Uh, why is this so difficult, especially when people on both sides of the aisle are so willing to do this, and we say we want more diversity in colleges and universities, and then we just make it difficult? And the reason why is because um, institutions, this is institutions recognize a, a certain type of professor that is a cisgender man who tends to be white, who tends to be heterosexual and have a stay-at-home wife. Um, so when we encounter these difficulties of, a, say, something that a single parent goes through, what we see are these snapshots of institutionalized sexism, homophobia, racism. Um, so I want to urge you all at the beginning of this talk to, if you don't know what your institutions are doing to support single mothers, and especially single mothers of color, to find out what kind of inst things your institution does do, and to urge them to do something else, because I probably, I'm guessing that they probably aren't doing nothing. Right, and because it shouldn't be this hard, especially when there's so many people on the ground who are willing to make this happen. So, now for the talk. Um, <laughs> I want to first start out by saying I do not have a degree in anthropology. My PhD is in women's studies, which will become evident with some of the things that I'm going to bring up when I talk about feminists studying up. I'm an interdisciplinary scholar, and my methods are based really in the in the discipline of history. I do a lot of oral histories and archival work. Uh, I conduct material cultural analysis and discourse analysis often, and I draw a lot from anthropology, surveys, interviews, focus groups, and participant observation. My new project that I'll be discussing, discussing today, too, is completely, I would say, autoethnographic, or as I like to call it, anthropologists discover the autobiography. In this talk, I'm going to discuss a little bit about my own positionality as a researcher through my research on the Syrian Christians in India and in the diaspora. 
I draw from many of the points brought up by last yesterday's keynote talk, um, Jim Spickard's, pick, uh, Spickard's pe keynote talk on self-reflexivity, and from Dina Womack's presentation this morning on feminist approaches, the deep listening, allowing oneself to be surprised, and critical self-awareness. Um, I then am going to discuss the concept of studying up as applies to my research and feminist scholarship in general, and I'll end with a, with a call for scholars of world Christianity, and especially for Catholic scholars, because my new project is specifically on, on Catholicism, to, to rise up, and a call to rise up and do something different. Um, so to begin, this is a picture that we might know. <laughs> This is a Covington Catholic High School student, Nick Salmon, smiling or maybe smirking, if you will, at a native elder from the Omaha nation and a veteran, Nathan Phillips. In all the different points of view that came out of this controversy, the Covington boys are racist or maybe the Covington boys were trying to outshout the rude and racist black Hebrew Israelites or if you wanted to believe um, Nick Salmon's publicist that said that Nick Salmon was just smiling at the native elder trying to convince Nathan Phillips that he was non-threatening. What we have with all of these different explanations is no explanation for the fact that the Covington boys were tomahawk chopping and, and doing the Braves baseball chant, both of which invoke the ideas of a savage, uncivilized, non-Western, and by extension, non-Christian native. Nor did the discussion of the Covington Catholic boys seem to discuss the history of the Catholic Church's relationship to Native peoples in the United States or to settler colonialism. In 1452, a papal bull was issued by Pope Nicholas V. It gave Port the Portuguese permission to capture, vanquish, and subdue the Saracens, pagans, and other enemies of Christ, and to put them into perpetual slavery and to take all their positions and property. In 1493, the bull was strengthened when Pope Alexander VI granted authority to Spain and Portugal to take all the lands and possessions if no Christian ruler had claimed them. These two papal bulls are known as the doctrine of discovery, and in effect, the doctrine of discovery religiously sanctioned the dispossession and the genocide of indigenous peoples. The discovery doctrine actually was used to justify a number of treaty violations throughout US history and has become part and parcel of US law. Most notably, the Supreme Court ruled in Johnson v. McIntosh in 1823 that the discovery of land issue, um, equates to ownership of that land, a ruling that was based in referencing the doctrine of discovery. Even in 2005, the doctrine of discovery was referenced by the Supreme Court in a ruling that denied the land claims of the Oneida Indians. Perhaps the clearest example of how Christianity is tied to the genocide of Native Americans are boarding schools and the separation of Native children from their families through foster care and speedy adoptions into white Christian families. In 2012, Maine became the first state in the US to conduct a Truth and Reconciliation Commission on the abuse in the foster care system in ICWA, or Indian Child uh, Welfare Act, non-compliance in the state, with many testimonies coming from members of Christian churches and involved in social work. Um, in 2015, Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission re recommended that the Pope should visit Canada and apologize for residential schools. Repeated calls to the Vatican were met with silence. In May of 2018, the Vatican made the official decision to not apologize for residential schools in Canada. In 2010, some churches, including the Episcopal Church, Unitarian Universalist Association, and the United Methodist Church, repudiated the doctrine of discovery. In 2015, when he visited Bolivia, Pope Francis talked about the, quote, many grave sins committed against Native peoples of America in the name of God, end quote. He met with indigenous peoples on his visit to Chile in Peru in 2018, and later that year, he invited the Association of Indigenous Peoples to St. Peter's Square in the Vatican. So I guess we could say progress. It only took 500 plus years or so for that to be made. Um, as scholars of world Christianity, how are we supposed to understand this history and Christianity's continued role in settler colonialism? The topic specifically of Catholic settler colonialism and boarding schools on native reservation has come up on my new research project on studying Indian Catholic priests um, on missions in rural Montana and some of these priests are serving on Native American reservations. Why study Indian priests in rural Montana? 
Well, as Richard mentioned, I was born and raised in this small town, Glendive, Montana. Here is a picture of my daughter in downtown Glendive. <laughs> when I was growing up, to me, like, you know, everything is relative, I guess. Glendive was a metropolis because we had a Kmart and a McDonald's. Um, the Kmart and McDonald's have since closed. <laughs> uh, it's actually was researched to be a town literally in the middle of nowhere. Um, and Glendive is also home to Makoshika State Park. I actually have nothing to say about this slide. I just think that Eastern Montana is very beautiful and if you haven't visited Eastern Montana, you should because, you know, tourism plug for the last best place on earth. Um, I grew up in a very devout Catholic family. Here is some of my family in the cold Montana winter standing outside of our parish church for my sister's first communion. My mom looks like a rock star wearing a Saudi after having five kids with one more to come. I am the toddler who's holding on to my older sister's hand. Um, growing up as a kid in the 80s and 90s in Glendive, Montana, our house actually was full of priests from India. The majority were from this community that I'll discuss, the Syrian Christian community, and came from Kerala, India, where my parents were from. So they spoke the same language as my parents, and they ate the same types of food. Here is my big old Catholic family um, with Father Sebastian in the late 80s. I am the fly girl in the yellow sweatshirt with the sleeves rolled up in the front. <laughs> Father Sebastian was stationed in Tioga, North Dakota, just across the border. I have an article uh, coming out on this subject in Women's Studies Quarterly, how and why Indian priests are coming to um, rural areas, not just Indian priests, uh, priests from the Global South, from countries in Asia and Africa. Montana has gotten a lot of priests from Nigeria, um, Vietnam, and the Philippines, but the majority of them have come from India. Um, I discuss how and why they come, the racism that they experience, and also the unexpected global connections between cowboys and Indians. Uh -huh. <laughs> so if you're curious about more about missionary priests in, in, from India and rural America, I'm going to direct you to that forthcoming paper, because we should cite ourselves. Women should cite ourselves, and we should cite women of color. Uh, Father Sebastian and my parents, like I said, come specifically from a particular rite of Catholicism known as the Syro Malabar Catholic heritage, as do many of the other Indian priests who come to rural areas of the United States. Syro Malabar Catholicism is an Eastern rite of Catholicism that is practiced in the South Indian state of Kerala, India. Syro Malabar Catholics are part of a larger group known as Syrian Christians. Syrian Christians in general are only 2.3% of the population of I India as a whole, but they make up 18.4% of this state's population. The Syrian Christians make up just under half of that Christian population. They are not Christians from Syria. Syrian Christians trace their conversion to the year 52 when St. Thomas the Apostle arrived on the Kerala coast and reportedly converted Brahmins to Christianity. Because the Syrian Christians practice their mass in the Aramaic or Syriac language, the label Syrian was used to distinguish them from Christians converted by Western missionaries using the Latin rite. Both the Portuguese missionaries in the 16th century and the later the British missionaries in the 19th century converted Hindus and Muslims largely from the lower castes. Today, there remains a glaring caste difference between the Syrian Christians and other denominations of Christians in Kerala. The Syrian Christians are considered forward caste by the Kerala state. That means that they do not qualify for reservations, or that's considered um, India's affirmative action pro program for lower caste peoples. There is also a racialized difference between um, the Syrian Christians and, and other Christians. Because they're Brahmins, the, the dominant caste Syrian Christians are considered to be Aryan Brahmins, and the Dalit Bahujan others are considered Dravidians. So I, t I discuss race as well when I, when I talk about this community. There's also a class difference between Christians because the Syrian Christian community over the centuries um, became landowners and became relatively affluent. Today they lead all other religious communities in Kerala in land ownership. They're also known for banking, 
rubber tree farming, and private education, all which have been extremely profitable for the community since 1947, since Indian independence. Their entrepreneurship is encapsulated in the somewhat disparaging, somewhat envious phrase in Malayalam used to describe the community, or even when he's fallen face down, he stands up holding a coin. These intersectional caste, race, class, religious issues were the topic of my first book, Privileged Minorities, now available on Amazon.com and from the <laughs> University of Washington Press. <laughs> the guiding thread between my first book project on the Syrian Christians and my second book project on Catholic missionary priests in rural America is not just the focus on Indian Christianity, it's also my never-ending social justice framework. This is a focus that is extremely attentive to my own positionality and a focus that is feminist, anti-racist, anti-caste, and built on studying up. So what is studying up, you ask? In 1969, Laura Nader's paper, Up the Anthropologist, hit the discipline of anthropology and opened up new ways to think about and critique and intervene into the colonialist framework of anthropology's roots. In the article, Nader discusses how anthropology itself tends to focus on the poor, on minorities, on the disadvantaged. Of course, this is based in anthropology's imperialist roots. I am a scholar from the Western world who does not need to be self-reflexive, and I go to places over there, and I study these downtrodden natives. Um, this would be studying down. In Up the Anthropologist, Nader shows that there's very little um, uh, research at the time on the middle class, even less research on the rich. She asks, what if in reinventing anthropology, anthropologists were to study the colonizers rather than the colonized, the culture of affluence rather than the culture of poverty? Nader also discusses how studying up and studying down go hand in hand. One cannot research impoverished neighborhoods without understanding rich school districts and white flight. One cannot study crime without studying white collar crime as well. Studying up can really change how we study down. Nader also discusses how there must be maybe a difficulty in gaining access to research sites when we study up. Elite groups function as elite groups because they cut off access to others. I would add that critiquing the powers that be can make studying up even more difficult for the ethnographer. And I'll get to that um, in a second, but especially for junior scholars or contingent labor, right? Many anthropologists have taken this idea of studying up and critiqued it. They have ran with it in their own projects. They have thought through issues of access or how studying up relates to issues of positionality. This coupled with what people call the postmodern churn in anthropology, I feel like we should call the postmodern churn the postcolonial churn, but that's just my own opinion. Um, the postmodern churn in anthropology has arguably led to a lot of changes in the field, and I'm not going to get into that in depth in this talk, but I do want to think about feminist ethnography and studying up as it pertains especially to world Christianity studies. For those of us who study Christianity in places where Christians are a minority population, I think there's an impetus to study down. I study Christians in a place where Christians are such a minuscule minority of the population that they're often overlooked in scholarship on minorities in India. The vast majority of studies that look at minorities looks at Muslims in India. When Christians are present, there's an almost automatic sliding of Christians into a subaltern or oppressed category. In her work on Christian fishing communities in South India, Ajanta Subramaniam has argued that within subaltern studies specifically, the subaltern is problematically depicted as outside secular society and having a religious world, worldview, religious outlook as their foundational worldview. Subramaniam argues that when scholars approach this view of subaltern life, what we do is a scholarly fetishizing of religiosity. I would add that this sort of fetishizing problematically tends to homogenize all Christian minorities as subaltern. This may especially be true because scholarship on Christianity in South Asian studies often focuses on conversion with a heavy focus on Dalit Christianity. Ab Abhijit Dasgupta and Rowena Robinson's paper this morning gave a bit of an intellectual history as to why this is. 
especially in the late edition of Christianity Studies II Studies on Religion in India. I would add to, to their kind of intellectual history that they gave this morning that Christian conversion, the idea of conversion, is intimately tied to the resistance of casteism. And there can be an uncritical romancing of that resistance as we fetishize the worldview of Christians. As Laida Abu, Abu Laghad's classic critique tells us, in the romance of resistance, there can be a focus on finding and explaining resistance rather than an explanation or an examination of power. Unfortunately, this is often the case when we come to scholarship on conversion in India. There are a few critical or um, ethnographic studies on the Syrian Christians. There are even less on the Syrian Malabar Catholics, which are the largest group of Syrian Christians that fall under the Syrian Christian category, and arguably, arguably the most vocal, the face of Syrian Christianity, and they're so involved in politics. And so it's very strange that there's no critical ethnographic studies on the Syrian Malabar Catholics. The lack of scholar critical scholarship on Syrian Christianity is countered by a plethora of studies by theologians and scholars from within the faith, but these often provide a detailed theological and liturgical analysis without an examination of casteism, classism, racism, political or sexual economy. Why is that? We can maybe conjecture that we, as scholars, feel the pull to study down. It's more interesting for us to see the Christ Syrian Christians as a minority group within a Hindu majority that has survived against all odds over the centuries. We may feel sympathy or are compelled to speak on behalf of Christians com persecuted by Hindu nationalism. The Syrian Christians are invoked even by the academic left to counter the Hindu nationalist understanding of non-Hindu religions as foreign. These, these types of scholarship go like this. Um, Syrian Christians are not a community that is foreign to India because they're indigenous Christians. Because their conversion in 52 predates European Christianity. Um, these types of historical academic referencing of Christian indigeneity assumes a studying down of minorities without any kind of discussion of casteism, racism, classism. I want to also touch on the problem that Nader, Lyndon, Laura Nader discusses about access, access to research sites when we try to study up. How do you get access to an elite community? And what are the consequences for studying such a community? The Syrian Christian hierarchy does not seem very friendly um, to such a dis discussion, and especially to what's called uh, an examination of Brahmanical patriarchal power. For those of you who study India, we, you might have heard of Brahman Brahmanical patriarchy. Um, in the United States, we talk about the racist patriarchy. You know, the idea that a sexist is just sexist and a racist is just racist. No, we kind of can understand that a racist can also be sexist, right? Um, and also, in the same vein, Brahman Brahmanical patriarchy refers to the intersections of casteism and patriarchy. As a dominant caste community, the Syrian Christians have entrenched themselves into the casteist and classist nature of Indian society. The policing of upper caste women's movements um, and ideas of issues of morality that are defined through upper casteness and the sexualization and sexual assaults against Dalit Bahujan women are tied to the way that patriarchy functions in India. So you can't just discuss patriarchy without discussing how this patriarchy functions through casteism. Two recent cases involving sexual abuse and specifically Syrian Malabar Catholic priests are important to outline here. The case against Bishop Franco Mulukal and the recently sentenced Father Robin. This past June, a Syrian Malabar nun reported uh, sexual abuse at the hands of Bishop Franco Mulukal to the police. The nun reportedly sent written complaints to the church authorities, including Cardinal George Allencherry, that were ignored. Only after her complaints were ignored by the church did she turn to the police. And even after her reports, were, her rapes were reported in June of 2018, it took the police until September to arrest Bishop Franco and to question him. The sister, along with five other sisters who have publicly supported her, have been subject to criticism and threats. Her picture was released by church lady, placing her even in a more precarious position and subject to political attack, to public attacks. A priest who supported the nun has mysteriously died. Um, it's still under investigation. 
The nuns who supported the survivor have been handed transfer orders by the convents that they belong to. They don't want them congregating together. The second case um, that I mentioned is Father Robin, a priest who is teaching at a school in Kotayur and the repeated rape of a 15-year-old student. The student gave birth to a baby in a Catholic hospital with Catholic doctors delivering the baby, and the baby was then placed in a Catholic orphanage. As details of the case emerged, her father, presumably under pressure from the Christian community and maybe the Christian hierarchy, falsely confessed to being the father of the baby. When the assertion came out as a lie, the mother of the teen falsified her birth certificate records to make it appear that she was 18 years old. In short, there was this kind of vast network of Christian cover-up going on. A Christian publication went as far to blaming the victim in this op-ed. Quote, here the partner in sin is more than 15 years old. Considering her in my daughter's position, I am saying, daughter, you went wrong, too went wrong. You will be the first one answerable before God. Why did you forget who the priest was? Why didn't you know that the sanctity of a priest is equal to the holiness of Jesus' heart? He has a human body. He can get temptations. If he might have forgot that for a few seconds, my child who has taken the Holy Communion, why didn't you stop or correct him? This is from a magazine that is widely read by the community called Sunday Shalom. Father Robin was only recently arrested and uh, recently convicted and sent to prison for 20 years. To study any of these cases, one gets the impression that you would not be taken to very kindly by the Christian community or the hierarchy. When I myself gave a paper on Sira Malabar Catholic traditions and Brahmanical patriarchy at a conference on different rites of Catholicism in Bangalore, I was chastised for pointing out that the word for Bible in Malayalam for Syrian Christians is Veda Pustagam, which literally translates to Veda Bible. And the word for Sunday school classes is Veda Bottom, which literally translates to lessons from the Veda. I was arguing that this has a direct relation between this upper caste Christian community and Brahm Brahmanical patriarchy, because only Brahmin males can study the Vedas. So why else would you call the Bible the Veda book? Right? So I was just pointing these kind of links between Syrian Christianity and Brahmanical patriarchy out. I wasn't even critiquing sexual violence in the church. Um, to which a Sir Malabar priest told me over and over again, no, you've got it wrong. Veda book is just what we call the Bible. And I was like, yeah. And that's what I'm saying. Like, why? Like, that's exactly what I'm saying. So it went back and forth like this. A year later, when my book was in production, my young cousin, Jimmy Alex, suddenly died. Sorry. Jimmy and his family belonged to a Sir Malabar church in Tampa, Florida. And at the funeral, there were many Sir Malabar priests at, at the funeral. He was very young. He was only 28. Um, and the archbishop came from, from Chicago, too, to the funeral. And a priest at the, at the funeral approached me and asked me if I was the person who gave a talk in Bangalore. He wagged his finger at me and saying, we are looking to read your book. I'm still, think, still so like, shocked at how inappropriate that was to do at my cousin's funeral. But just at the real display of power that takes, I started to get really freaked out that my family members might be attacked just because I mentioned Brahmanical patriarchy in my book. I even met with a Colby College general counsel, counsel to help me think about potential lawsuits because there's something in India there's like um, you can sue somebody for hurting the religious sentiments of a community. So I'm like, this is going to happen to me, like they're saying this at my cousin's funeral. Um, and I was, again, I was only mentioning Brahmanical patriarchy. Such displays are not the greatest incentive to study up, especially for junior scholars and for contingent faculty where you have everything to lose with going up against the powers that be. But that's Christianity in India, where Christians are the minorities, and there might be a proclivity to only study down. What about Christianity in the United States? Um, maybe it's different here. This brings me to my second book project in uh, this project that I'm calling Cowboys and Indians. When I started this project, I was really, really shocked by the lack of scholarship about Christianity and settler colonialism in the United States. 
After the Nick San Sandman Covington Catholic Boys incident, the historian William Cozen wrote a piece for the Washington Post on Catholic settler colonialism. And you know, he, he, he had friended me on Twitter and he had to take himself off Twitter because he got so much backlash for even suggesting something about Christianity and settler colonialism in the United States. Cozen argued that in this uh, op-ed in the Washington Post, Cozen argued that parish and Catholic histories rarely delve into their own records of how the church actively participated in and supported the US government's genocidal colonization of America. As Cozen states, trying to make sense of the troubling scene that took place at the Indigenous Peoples March may be difficult for the Diocese of Covington and for Catholics not familiar with the US Catholic Church's often violent relationship with Indigenous Catholics and non-Catholics. The records of abuse of many Native Americans by Catholic clerics in Alaska and New Mexico, and I would add to that Montana, for example, are just starting to be uncovered by historians, even though memories of colonizing violence have remained alive within communities for decades. Reckoning with this past is essential for coming to terms with injustices faced by indigenous peoples, both in history and in the 21st century. I find this so very true in this new book project that I'm working on. As mentioned, I'm looking at Indian priests, many from the Syrian Christian community who are serving as missionaries in rural areas of the United States. Originally, I just wanted to look at the interactions between cowboys and Indians, red states that are anti-immigrant sentiments, but also looking at transnational flows of money, um, the idea about what spiritual labor is and migration and global charity. It's quite striking where the Catholic Church in the US invests in. They tend to ask the priest to change, to work on their accents and to deal with what they call cultural mismatches. There are a couple of training programs available for international priests. In this, the church assumes the racial acceptance of white congregants, not much is done to prepare congregates for the arrival of international priests. Nor is there acknowledgement of the racism that priests might encounter, which are varied and vast. For example, a white American-born priest told me that when the Indian priest was introduced into the neighboring parish, the American-born priest suddenly had five to 10 white refugees, as he called them, start attending his mass rather than having the Indian priest say mass. Similarly, a congregate, a congregate recounted, in particular, I do remember one of the gentlemen I work with on the railroad. I remember him telling me one day, I'm not going back to the Catholic Church as long as they have the priest from India here. Another white American born priest told me that the arrival of an Indian priest into his parish created more work for him because parishioners specifically asked for the white priest rather than asking for the Indian priest whenever there was a funeral to be done or a baptism or a marriage, any of the sacraments basically. We'd have to think about, if we were to study any of this would mean that we'd have to take a hard look and critique the racial innocence of the Catholic Church and Christianity and Christians in the United States. We'd have to study up and think about how Christianity and Christians are complicit in white supremacy and racism. This can actually help us reframe how we study down not losing sight of how rural communities themselves are affected by aging populations, by outmigration, by impoverished school districts, you know, and, and just real class disparities of the rural in comparison to urban United States. At the beginning stages of this research, I was focused on Indian priests in predominantly white towns, like I said, but at least five Indian priests in Montana that I know of so far have served in or, or on Native American reservations. The diocese of my upbringing, Great Falls Billings, covers a, a, an area of central and eastern Montana where we have five different Native American reservations and eight US recognized tribes, even more non-recognized tribes. Additionally, there are really some strange things going on between Indian Indians and American Indians. Uh, a church on the Crow Reservation is called St. Francis Xavier Church after the Portuguese um, saint who converted tens of thousands of Muslims and Hindus in South India in the 16th century. The St. Thomas Apostle Church is located in Harlem near the Fort Belknap Reservation, and the St. Thomas Church is on the Fort Belknap Reservation. These feel like weird coincidences, or maybe not coincidences, to, to look into. Were early white missionary priests bent on creating an example of missionaries in India um, on the reservations? Could racial or racist experiences of priests on reservations be different than what they experience in white towns? Would their congregations connect with them differently than to say a white priest on a reservation? 
This past summer, I went to gather more research specifically on this subject. I sat in on masses and events with Indian priests on two different reservations and on numerous border towns. Interestingly, maybe we can think, many of the people at this, these masses and at these events were not native, they were white. Um, so I've interviewed so far 12 uh, peoples from five different tribes. When I started each of the interview with informed consent, um, discussing what I was researching, we moved really quickly into talking about the Indian priest that was um, on or near the reservation to aspects of settler colonial violence, Catholic boarding schools being the foremost among them, both sexual and physical violence at the hands of priests and nuns in the boarding schools, and the violence of tearing children from their families and forcing assimilation policies on children. Here are the words of Erica on the Fort Belknap Reservation. And I should say, like, I changed um, to protect my research participants, changed their names. My grandfolks, my mom's parents, they grew up and spoke fluent Grovan. My whole family went to the mission. My grandfolks were here at the time that the reservation was made, 1836. Anyway, they attended the mission as well. My mom, my grandmother, my grandfather. Not by choice, though. The priests would come and pick them up. They would take them. They told their parents they were going to take them and educate them and bring them home. They didn't ever bring them home. They were abused there. They spoke their language, and they were forced not to speak it. They were punished severely for speaking Grova and Assiniboine. But my grandma wouldn't talk about it. So when they would speak Indian, their native language, I listened to them laugh. And they would make their own flowers for Decoration Day. I said, Grandma, I want to laugh too. I was about three. I would say, what are you saying? And she said, no, you don't need to know that. You're going to be educated. You're going to compete with the white man. You have to. And so I really wanted to learn, but they wouldn't speak it in front of us. The role of the research here, here I think, is a very difficult one. This is a historical trauma that is not my trauma, and it is not related to Indian priests on the reservation, or kind of is it, Yet it's being told to me, and as a feminist ethnographer who is committed to studying up as well as studying down, I'm committed to understanding what it means for a priest from India to move voluntarily, to leave their friends and family, and to migrate to a rural area of the US, just as much as I try and to th think through the involuntary moving of native peoples from their families. There are different meanings to spiritual labor here. There are different meanings of spiritual labor when we think through historical trauma of settler colonial violence. The historical and lingering trauma of sexual violence at boarding schools is especially heinous. The Diocese of Billings Great Falls recently went bankrupt due to sexual abuse victim lawsuit payouts. Many of these lawsuits are being brought by Montana natives. One of the most frustrating parts of this research is the archives and secondary sources that are available. Researching through the Montana State Archives about boarding schools, there very little appears. And when it does, it's just plain infuriating to read this stuff. Take, for instance, this history of the St. LeBray mission by, written by Reverend Emmett Hoffman. During the year 1882, there were 250,000 buffalo killed in what was then known as Custer County. That's after George General Armstrong Custer. There are markers like this all over Montana, like the Forsyth, Montana is named after General Forsyth, the mastermind of Wounded Knee Massacre. So there are constant reminders of this. In August 1884, Bishop Brundell visited the St. LeBray Mission and the Cheyenne Settlement and saw the extreme destitution which these poor people were suffering. This pleading was emphasized by the presence of two young Indian men who stood before Bishop Brundell. One had eaten no food for two days, the other for four. The good Bishop Brundell ordered a steer to be purchased at once and had the meat distributed to these starving people. This story of Bishop Brundell's charity comes up again and again about any kind of history about the St. LeBray mission. It's almost celebrated without any kind of discussion about killing 250,000 buffalo is a, a form of genocide. I can't stomach reading this history knowing, too, that the author that has so much praise for Bishop Brundell's so-called charity, Emmett Hoffman, was one of the priests named in a sexual abuse lawsuit brought against the Diocese of Great Falls Billings by a Native woman. How is the historical trauma that is so evident in Native communities 
but is not discussed in the larger scholarship on Christianity, not present in the archives. What does it mean to do this type of ethnographic research, especially when studying up is necessary for community healing? When we study missionaries in the Christian diaspora, are we studying Christianity's involvement, complicity, and advancement in settler colonial states? Or do we merely talk about the racism that international missionary priests encounter? When we study Christian, Christians in other areas of the world where there are minorities, do we merely study resistance? Or do we have a simultaneous analysis of power? When Christianity itself is tied to centuries of casteism, to settler colonialism, to genocide, to sexual violence, it's imperative not just to study down, but to understand that studying down cannot stand on its own. It must be accompanied by studying up. Yes, access to research sites are harder, and the critique leveled against scholars who might do this kind of research is scarier. The risk for research participants may be even greater. But all of our research must be orientated to social justice. That's what I think. I mean, all of our research must be orientated to social justice. It's not an opinion, it's a fact. Um, we require a feminist, anti-racist, anti-caste understanding of studying up. I know in this particular talk, I've talked a lot about Catholicism specifically, but everything that's happening with the global Catholicism right now with sexual violence and the hierarchies, protection of <coughs> abuser priests, victims being children, native peoples, and nuns, might make it seem like studies on Catholicism are in particular need of such an analysis. I would argue that Christianity, though, in general, just needs to be studied, take a look at itself in studying up, as Corey Williams presented on the hashtag MeToo movement this morning. Um, I was just also thinking about the Houston Chronicle's recent expose about sexual abuse in the Southern Baptist Church. These past two days, we've seen many scholars here at this conference share their feminist studying up ethnographic research, and I thank you all for that. I think it's been really enlightening. But if you haven't thought through these issues of inequality in your own work on world Christianity, consider this a call for scholars. Ask the questions, when we read particular narratives of missionaries, why are stories being told that way? Why, where is historical trauma actually narrative, narrated, and where is it deliberately erased, and why? Why are there so many scholarly works on studying down? And why aren't there an equal amount of the important corollary of studying up? Is it the privilege of the researcher, the difficulty of access, the fear of critique, the romance of resistance, or the blindness of the ethnographer that's preventing us from studying up in world Christianity studies? If ever there was a time to reflect on these past practices and move in new directions, it's now. A time when anti-Semitism, fascism, white supremacy, and authoritarian governments are on the rise where we're in the midst of hashtag Me Too, Black Lives Matter, and hashtag Don't Erase Us, when we have a white supremacist terrorist killing 40 Muslims at two different mosques in Christchurch this whole weekend. I just can't stop thinking about this. What better time to study up than now in World Christianity Studies? Thank you. I'd like to say thank you for that rich and fascinating talk. Um, I am trained as an anthropologist, which you think would be an advantage in responding here, but the problem with anthropologists is that we're fascinated by everything. <laughs> so now I have too many questions that I'd like to ask, and I want to leave time for your questions as well. So I'll simply say that what I love about your talk is that I think that you really led us through an autoethnographic perspective and what that looks like, and I'm so appreciative of that because it's difficult and it's risky, as you say, that studying up here comes with costs to the researcher. Um, so I'm very appreciative of that. I'm also appreciative of your reference here to Laura Nader's work and to thinking about, um, I think, the costs of the discipline here in world Christianity to only using the downward gaze. And um, one of the things that I heard um, thinking through the reception of Laura Nader's work is that sometimes it was misunderstood what she meant by studying up, but that a byproduct, if you're doing studying up and studying down and sideways correctly, is indignation. And so what I appreciate in your concern with respect to social justice is I can hear this indignation coming through, this attention to the root causes of oppression and our unjust relationships with one another. So um, another scholar that you reference uh, is Lila Abu Logod's work. And I think here, when you talked about romanticizing resistance and the challenge with that, I think that applies to world Christianity so deeply. So I think about um, how Abu Logod is glossing Foucault. Um, 
and talking about that power doesn't just work negatively, it also works positively. So um, we have to grapple with resistance that is not exterior, but rather embedded in the relations of power itself. And so here, we learn that studying down can lead to this fetishizing, it can lead to romanticizing resistance, it fails to examine and contextualize, I think, dare I say, intersectionalize power. Um, so I think this helps us see such a danger in world Christian studies on liberation, because sometimes we want to see God's liberating power and index it, rather than recognize how we are bound within um, and how liberation and oppression are bound to one another. So this leads me to my first question um, with respect to the Cyril Malabar priests that you mentioned and these injustices. Um, and I guess this is a little bit more just asking you to pull out of your first book project, but I'm interested in how um, not just nuns and 15-year-old rape victims, but these upper caste uh, Syrian Christian women um, and how they navigate their practice of religiosity and the complex power here. I get the sense that your feminist studying up wields a complexity that uh, we need to understand in order to understand the power of patriarchy and how it may be also embedded in resistance in ways that only you, I think, can illuminate. Uh, the second question is just to ask you to say more about uh, this concept of spiritual labor with respect to historical trauma of settler colonial violence. Um, again, it was so helpful that you referenced the heinous sexual violence of these boarding schools and the relationship to Catholicism. I'd be curious to hear you nuance, because I think that's one thing that ethnography does well, is to nuance a bit more for us. Um, because my anticipation is that white supremacy lingers and embeds itself in religious practice. So can you say more about how that may or may not be the case, how do priests experience their spiritual labor, and what position does the diocese play in these placements? I was really interested in that, how Catholic settler um, power still maybe encodes this culturally plural, really fascinating milieu. And um, finally, if you're so willing, you can certainly say no, because I think you've given us such a vulnerable um, talk today. Uh, but I'm just so eager to hear a little bit more about your own indignation and where you pin it down in this uh, sea of unequal power relations. Um, I know that for many of us in this room, our ethics would come uh, from a theological orientation to the world. So I think then what we're always struggling with in a seminary is what does it look like as a scholar and a researcher to be deeply bound to that theological orientation, committed to it, and yet critical of it um, historically, politically, and culturally. So I'd relish your willingness to continue to guide us through how you think through some of those politics, as you said, of social justice from a feminist perspective, a feminist studying up, so that we can continue to deconstruct privilege and dismantle this inequality in our own uh, perspectives as you ask us to do so, which is a very worthy challenge. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.